What are the best jazz albums to listen to if you want to fully understand and learn how to play this music? Let's go over the top 10 you absolutely need to know. So we're going to be talking about jazz albums that start with what I would call the early jazz period and go all the way through to the modern jazz period. These were all roughly recorded in chronological order, but certainly they follow the most important periods of jazz that you absolutely need to be aware of. Now, of course, there are many important jazz albums out there, but these 10 are the ones that I would say have the most significant impact on the direction of the music. And if you want to learn and play jazz better, you definitely should study these. Let's start with the first period of jazz, which is early jazz. Now, when I talk about early jazz, I'm talking about the early 1900s when jazz was really emerging. We have the Jelly Roll Mortons and all sorts of other musicians that are kind of creating this music. This music is really springing out of New Orleans. It's coming from the blues. It's coming from European march music. And recording is only recently being invented and people recording music and listening to recorded music. So that leads us to jazz album number one, Louis Armstrong, The Complete Hot Five and Hot Seven Sessions. Now this is a box set recording and so it includes a lot of different recordings from Louis Armstrong's two bands, The Hot Five and The Hot Seven between 1925 and 1928. Louis Armstrong, without a shadow of a doubt, is one of the most important and influential jazz musicians who has ever lived. Literally, he was playing like no one else was playing. He was essentially the pioneer of what has turned into modern jazz. Literally, once Louis Armstrong emerged on the scene, everybody was essentially trying to copy him and sound like him. Now, his first band, The Hot Five, really exemplifies the kind of instruments that were being played back then for jazz. The instrument in The Hot Five band was trumpet, coronet, clarinet, trombone, piano, and banjo. So notice there's no drums, there's no bass, and there's no guitar really either. It's actually a banjo, it's playing a very percussive role. But then his next band, The Hot Seven, also introduced the tuba and the drums. So the tuba taking the place of what we would think of in jazz as the upright bass playing the bass part, and then finally getting those drums in there for the rhythm. It's absolutely important for you to hear where this music started and listen to a bunch of recordings from this era, but certainly you're going to be off to a great start if you listen to this Hot 5 and Hot 7 band compilation by Louis Armstrong. All right, now moving on to the next era of jazz, which is called the Swing Era. Now, the Swing Era really did come about in the late 1920s, but really the 30s is dominated there with what we call the swing era. And that's when we really have this focus on big bands playing music and arrangements and all this stuff that's super danceable. And so this is really one of the only times in the history of music where jazz was actually popular music. People love to actually go dance and go to dance halls. Like this was a big thing that people loved to do. So album number two is Duke Ellington, Ellington at Newport. Now, admittedly, this is not a recording from the, I guess, swing era. It actually was recorded in 1956. However, if we're talking about an incredibly important musician within jazz, Duke Ellington is by far one of the most important. Not only was he a prolific composer, collaborator, a band leader, right? He introduced a lot of what we call great American songbook tunes into our arsenal. I'm talking about tunes like Satin Doll or Take the A-Train. And so during the swing era, Duke Ellington was absolutely huge. In fact, it's been said that there really wasn't a lot of competition with him. He was just the biggest band back then. However, eventually as the music changed, Duke Ellington's band kind of fell out of popularity, but it's claimed that this concert, that this record is based off of, the Ellington at Newport record, was done at the Newport Jazz Festival in 1956. And it's said that this is actually one of the most important live jazz recordings out there, the most popular ones. And some say that this actually put Duke Ellington's band back on the map again with this concert. The album includes like a bunch of Duke Ellington classics like Take the A-Train, for example. But the one that really stands out is called Dimuendo and Crescendo in Blue. And this is where Duke Ellington features his saxophone player, Paul Gonzalez, on a solo in which he continues to take a really long, amazing solo. And literally you can hear the crowd getting fired up and going absolutely nuts over this solo. So it was a huge moment in the concert. So if you really wanna understand Big Band and the swing era, this is an absolutely great album to listen to and study. All right, now let's move on to the bebop era. 
Now the bebop era it was really dominant in the 1940s. And this is where the music kind of shifted from being this danceable music that people would go out and dance to, to a more virtuosic music that was based on the ability of the musician itself. And it's said that this bebop style kind of spawned out of, you know, the professional musicians, they're playing in the bands and they're playing at the dance halls. And then after that's all over, they're going to clubs and to jam sessions and they're playing what are called cutting sessions where essentially they're trying to one up each other, right? They're trying to play the most impressive improvisations and solos. So it's really sort of more about the musician and their ability and what they can actually technically do on their instrument than it is about making people dance. And and that leads us to jazz album number three, which is Charlie Parker's The Quintet Jazz at Massey Hall. Now this album, of course, features Charlie Parker, who is by far the biggest pioneer of bebop and his sidekick, of course, Dizzy Gillespie, Dizzy Gillespie being another huge pioneer of bebop because they essentially were doing it together. And so if you really wanna understand really what bebop is all about, you absolutely need to listen to Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. And this particular album was recorded in Toronto in 1953. It's a live concert. The sound quality isn't necessarily the best, but the content of the music is exactly what the foundations of bebop are all about. And of course, the content of the music is amazing. A lot of bebop classics are presented on the album like Salt Peanuts, or of course, their rendition of All the Things You Are, a classic Great American Songbook tune. It's pretty much essential for anyone who wants to play jazz nowadays and actually go to jam sessions and play and play the style that you know some bebop tunes and that you can play to some degree in the style of bebop, unless of course your entire aim is to play the early jazz or Dixie land style of music. So that's number three, the quintet Jazz at Massey Hall by Charlie Parker. Now, before we go any further, of course, there are many more important bands, band leaders, musicians, and albums within these eras that are worthy of listening to and also important. So feel free in the comments down below, leave the albums that you think are the most important and the musicians you think are most important to learn jazz and understand it more fully. Okay, going on to the next era of jazz, which is called post-bop. Now, like it suggests, post-bop essentially means the styles that came after bebop. And like I said, bebop was a period that really changed the music of jazz completely. And so what spawned afterwards was essentially a bunch of different styles that came out of bebop. And one of those styles was called hard bop. And hard bop came out of the East Coast of the United States and its characteristics were a little bit more aggressive, you could say, or intense, really big focus on the blues, a lot of like heavy swing playing. And so the hard bop style was super prevalent in a lot of important bands. But this leads us to album number four, which is Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, Monin. Monin was recorded in 1958, and Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers is an incredibly important band. Art Blakey is the drummer, he's the band leader. There are many different iterations of the Jazz Messengers, but the cast of characters on the Monin album are probably the most iconic. These would include Lee Morgan on the trumpet, Benny Golson on the saxophone, Bobby Timmons on the piano, Jimmy Merritt on the bass, and then of course, Art Blakey on the drums. And actually, a bunch of the songs on this album are now what we would consider jazz standards, common repertoire that jazz musicians play. For example, the title track, Monin, which we actually studied in our Inner Circle membership, is a super important jam session jazz standard that you absolutely need to know and it grew super hard. And the solos that are played, the Benny Golson, specifically the Benny Golson and the Lee Morgan solos are incredibly iconic. So much so that jazz musicians in their solos constantly are quoting these different solos that Lee Morgan and Benny Golson played years and years and years and years later. There's a tune on there called Blues March, uh, another really important jazz standard that's called Along Came Betty is on this album. So Monin by Art Blakely and Jazz Messengers is an incredibly great example of the style of hard bop. Okay, now we're moving on to a very important year in jazz and that's 1959. A lot of really important jazz albums came out in 1959, notably three that are super, super important. And they also happen to cover the other styles within post-bop. So album number five is Miles Davis's 
Kind of Blue. Again, this album was recorded in 1959. It is considered to be one of the greatest jazz albums of all time. Now, of course, Miles Davis is by far one of the most important jazz musicians that you need to know about for a multitude of different reasons. So A, him as a musician, he was even playing back with Charlie Parker, but he is just obviously an amazing jazz musician, but also he was an incredible band leader. He had many different bands. And because of Miles Davis's bands and his mentorship, many amazing other jazz musicians like Herbie Hancock, like Wayne Shorter, went on to create their own prolific careers. So the Kind of Blue album is what we call modal jazz. Modal jazz meaning that it's not necessarily always based on what we call diatonic harmony, meaning harmony that's in the key center of a tune, like C major or E flat major. It's more so based on the modes, which are essentially based on the major scale. And while we're not gonna go into all the music theory behind that right now, modal music allows for a lot more flexibility as far as playing chords that aren't necessarily, again, diatonic together. The most classic example of modal jazz actually is on this album, which is the song called So What? And it features only two chords, D minor seven and E flat minor seven. That's really all it is. And it's really just this expansive experiment with how do you improvise over just one chord? Now, of course, also on there are blueses, uh, Freddie Freeloader, but again, even if you're listening to the way Miles Davis is playing on top of Freddie Freeloader, which is a blues, it's still more of this modal style of playing. So, Kind of Blue, super important album to study. Now, album number six is Dave Brubeck's Time Out. Again, this is another important album that came out in 1959, and Dave Brubeck and many of the musicians on his album are what we consider to be called cool jazz. Again, this is another post-bop emergent style. And cool jazz was more characteristic of more laid back style, a little bit more, uh, perhaps you could say, classical influence in the music. And for the most part, this music was being developed on the west coast of the United States. So if you really want to understand cool jazz, then Dave Brubeck's Time Out is a really good one to study. And of course, out of this album came some really famous recordings like Take Five, like even non-jazz musicians or people who even listen to jazz music know the song Take Five. And notably that explores the concept of odd time signatures. That one's in five, four time, whereas most of the songs in jazz in general up to that point are in four, four time or three, four time. There's also a tune called Blue Rondo a la Turk on there. It's like a very thematic song and a great one to study as well and listen to. Album number seven is Ornette Coleman's The Shape of Jazz to Come. This is our last album that was recorded in 1959 that's really important, and it also goes over another style of post-bop, which is free jazz. Now, the basic premise of free jazz is essentially not being constrained to a set of chord changes and having to play over chord changes or even having to play in time. And this really ranges all from an album like The Shape of Jazz to Come all the way to like super avant-garde, like Cecil Taylor stuff where you just play whatever the heck you want. But Ornette Coleman, the alto saxophone player, was actually a really important pioneering figure of free jazz. And even if you don't want to play free jazz, like this is a really important album that you absolutely should study. And also there's some important jazz musicians on this album. Of course, you have Ornette Coleman on sax. And by the way, he actually played a, a plastic saxophone. There's Don Cherry on the trumpet. There's Charlie Hayden on the bass, super important bass player, and Billy Higgins on the drums. And then there's some really important songs in there too. Like Lonely Woman is, is the first song. It's super haunting. It's super cool. Again, like they have this theme and then they're just sort of, they're even still playing in time and stuff, but then they're just kind of improvising and playing off each other and it's really cool and creative. But then there's actually one that's more rooted in diatonic harmony and that's Peace, which is a ballad. And it's actually an important jazz standard to learn. So really important album, The Shape of Jazz to Come by Ornette Coleman. Album number eight is John Coltrane's Giant Steps. You knew John Coltrane could not be left off of this list because really when we think about jazz, we think of guys like Louis Armstrong, Charlie Parker, Miles Davis, and John Coltrane. And John Coltrane, many would say, is like the father of modern jazz. Like he's the guy that took everything to the next level. And to this day, if you go down into New York City to the many jam sessions that rage on till four o'clock in the morning, you are going to hear a slew of saxophone players that are clearly clearly influenced by John Coltrane. John Coltrane not only was an amazing player, like 
He played in Miles Davis's bands. He was even on the Kind of Blue album. He played over jazz standards incredibly in his own unique voice, but he's also a huge innovator and Giant Steps is really where you see that coming out a lot. Giant Steps, the song is actually considered one of the most complicated songs really that's out there in jazz as far as the musician is concerned, actually playing it and improvising over it. But really you could argue that any of the songs that implemented his Coltrane Changes, which was his special unique harmonic formula where you were modulating in thirds, that any of the songs like Countdown or any of them, Central Park West, they're really all very hard songs to play until you get familiar with his Coltrane Changes patterns. Not to mention, some of these songs are played at blazing fast tempos, like Giant Steps, if you actually listen to Tommy Flanagan, who's the piano player. I believe they didn't really get the music till like maybe the same day for Giant Steps, but didn't get a lot of time to actually practice perform this incredibly difficult song. And you can actually hear in the recording, poor Tommy Flanagan is like actually trying to keep up and improvise and his improvisation kind of fizzles out a bit. And then John Coltrane comes in and jumps in on his solo, absolutely tearing it apart. I feel bad for Tommy Flanagan because uh, I mean, he has recorded other versions of it. And of course he sounds amazing. I guess he just didn't have a lot of time to look over it. and. Even still, he definitely played it a lot better than I would have. So if you want to understand the innovations of John Coltrane and really the heart of John Coltrane and impact he had on the music of jazz, definitely Giant Steps is an important one to check out. Okay, we're done with post-bop, moving on to the next era of jazz, and this is best known as fusion. Now, fusion is really where rock and jazz sort of start to meet together. And really this kind of comes about with the advent of electronic instruments coming out, the synthesizer, the electric guitar, and all the different innovations that came from all that. So you start seeing this happen in the 1960s and of course the 1970s and, and on. So album number nine is Miles Davis's Bitches Brew. So this album was recorded in 1970, really groundbreaking, really, obviously Miles Davis, he had kind of has his hand in every single era of jazz. He had his hand in bebop, he had his hand in modal jazz, he had his hand in hard bop, he had his hand in cool jazz, he had his hand in even free jazz styles, and then of course fusion, and then later on in his life before he died, pop. So really when you listen to this album, you're hearing a lot of textures, you're hearing obviously a lot of electronic instruments, you're hearing a lot of reverb, you're hearing a lot of experimental ideas happening, and there's all sorts of musicians that came out of these albums with Miles Davis's fusion years that are huge now. Uh, one notable song would be Spanish Key, but of course, there's a lot of interesting songs on the album to listen to. So that's number nine, Bitches Brew by Miles Davis. Okay, now moving on to the next era of jazz, which really is just best defined as modern jazz. Modern jazz in my mind is really anything that's kind of come about from like maybe the mid eighties till like now. And this might be the most controversial of the albums that I name because there's really so many different sub-styles of modern jazz. You have the Robert Glaspers with the hip hop stuff. You have the New York modern jazz guys. You have the Pat Metheny. You have so many different like artists and, and different styles that emerged. So this one might be just a little bit biased, but I think many will also agree. Album number 10 is Kurt Rosenwinkel's Deep Song. Now more than the album being important, which is really just more of my personal bias, it's the artist Kurt Rosenwinkel. Really when I think of modern jazz, I think of Kurt Rosenwinkel. Kurt Rosenwinkel, for those who don't know, is a guitarist and really an incredible influential musician on many different modern jazz players. And whenever you go to any of his concerts, at least here in New York City, like the Vanguard, like he's selling out every single show because he is that big of a musician's fandom. Really Kurt Rosenwinkel, I think of him as an innovator, sort of like, you know, John Coltrane was and Miles Davis. And I'm not arguing if he's as much of an innovator. I'm just saying that he's an innovative jazz musician that has a very unique voice really pushes the composition of jazz to the next level, non-diatonic harmony, fusing melodies together in amazing ways, but really still also holding on to the traditions of jazz with like blues and all that, you still hear that in his music. And so Deep Song is a great album if you really wanna understand Kurt Rosenwinkel and his music, as well as listen to a lot of other important modern jazz players like Brad Meldow, the piano players on there, Joshua Redman, the saxophone players on there. A lot of great songs 
songs on this album, there's a shifting design. There's his rendition of If I Should Lose You, which is a jazz standard, but played in straight eighth style. But probably my favorite song off the album is called The Next Step. And he actually has an album called The Next Step, but his version, in my opinion, on Deep Song is the best version of that song and really just swings hard. So now something else you might wonder is, what are important jazz songs that I should learn to play jazz? Like if I were to go to a jam session, which ones would I want to know? Well, on the screen right now, I have a video that's 10 must know jazz standards for jam sessions. Go ahead and look at that one, see how many of those you know, and make sure you fill in the blanks on the ones that you don't. Hey, if you like learning jazz standards, we learn a new one every single month in my Inner Circle membership. I'll leave a link to that in the description down below or also here on the screen. Make sure you like this video if you found it valuable, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you in the next one. Cheers.